In the Sermon on the Mount, today we are going to go on and share with you a message entitled, Your Choices Will Make You. Your Choices Will Make You, literally. Only two verses as we end the Sermon on the Mount. And this is taken from the book of Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. This is what Matthew recorded of what Jesus said. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. For many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So bear in mind, Matthew has been giving us the teachings of Jesus as he recorded it. Again, remember, he's a tax collector. He's an, he's an accountant. He's good with numbers. And Matthew had written the 24 chapters of uh, the book of Matthew, or the, or the 28, from the first to the end, almost broken, broken it up into five different parts. It's almost like what we call the uh, Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. The, the whole Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh, but the first five is called the Torah. And so it's broken into five, and he writes it almost like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so on. And so in this first part, uh, when he speaks about the Sermon on the Mount after the introduction of Jesus as coming from the seed of David, then he begins to almost bring it to an end. And in the next two or three sermons, we wind it up. But just before he ends, he says, I've told you so many things the way Jesus taught. Now... I want you to know that this is really the crux of the matter. This here is the, the, the epitome of all that I'm saying. It's all about entering into heaven. It's a narrow gate. And if you miss life, there's a, rate, a, a, a gate to destruction which is very, very broad. Now, uh, because it's only two verses, instead of me trying to explain it to you, I think it's best to let Scripture interpret itself. Amen? In fact, the best... <laughs> Uh, the best study we can do of the Word of God is really to let the Scriptures. This uh, narrow gate and wide gate also has to do with um, the concept of popularity. What is popular? What is uh, probably the latest? What is uh, sensational as opposed to what may not necessarily be? Um, today we live in an age where uh, I've mentioned many times, we, people have sometimes this mindset like, I'm entitled to something. I'm entitled to what I need. I'm, I'm entitled to what is good. In this consumer mindset and an entitlement generation, sometimes we can approach God, God forbid, with that same spirit. A spirit like, I'm coming to you because, you know, you got to give me something or you owe me something. I want to be very clear that uh, God owes us nothing. As a matter of fact, it was His love that gave us atonement and redemption and salvation. Amen? So that's why we come to God, because we were already on the way, on the path to death and destruction. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, the wages of sin is death. And every person was on that path until God reached out and said, my, by my blood, through my son, through my atonement, I'm going to save you. So in the, that way is narrow. It's not necessarily popular. Uh, opposed to the gospel, we have other or many, many kinds of what we call religion. Religion basically tells you that, hey, you don't need God. You can always fix things yourself. You can actually make yourself feel better. So when you approach religion, religion is sort of a self-help program. You help yourself. You really don't need God. Are you with me today? You know what I mean? So therefore, um, whereas Jesus, and that, that's a very popular path. Hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions want to follow it. But just because everybody follow it, just because it's popular and sensational, does not make it right. Amen. 
So now we want to ask ourselves, what is this narrow gate and wide gate? Matthew is recording exactly what Jesus spoke. And remember here, Jesus is the Son of God. And he's giving us the option. He says, look, guys, you have a choice. Do you want to do what's popular? A lot of people are doing it. You're welcome. Knock yourselves out. But some, what I'm telling you is not necessarily popular, but it's the right thing and the truth which sets us free. Sometimes it hurts too. Amen? Sometimes when you speak the truth, it hurts. So what is this? So again, probably the two most crucial sentences of Jesus among all he said. And after all that has been said and after all that has been done, he says, now the choice is yours. You've got to make a choice. And your, your choice will determine exactly where you're going to go. Um, today, it's very common for us to use GPS, whether you drive or you ride your bicycle or you even walk and you find somewhere. It's quite often. How many of you have never, ever used a GPS before? Can I see your hands? Okay, I, I was, I'm quite shocked that you, maybe you don't know uh, when you are in a bus or in a car or in, the, or in a ta taxi or even in the plane, somebody else is using the GPS which you are part of. <laughs> By the way, I, I don't know whether you heard about a report that came out of, the, of one of the airlines. There, were two, there was a short flight, about two and a half hours, and uh, the co-pilot and the pilot both fell asleep while the plane was flying. Uh, I hope you were not in that plane. Anyways, <laughs> uh, what happens is that whenever you, you follow the path, uh, the, the GPS will guide you, and even when you make a mistake, it will try and get you back to the place. That's the purpose of the scripture. So what you choose, and you can choose to ignore it, totally ignore the, 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 the guidance, and then uh, you may end up in a place that you don't want to be. So let's follow the guidance. Amen? The choice is yours. Uh, what I'll do is basically share with you a few scriptures. Um, the first thought I want to leave behind you is what, you, what I would say there was one upon a time when this world was so filled with people Still, scholars have an uh, you know, argument as to how many people were there. This is before the flood of Noah. Some said in the thousands, some said in the millions, and some even say in the billions. So we don't know exactly, but there were many, many human beings, uh, or at least human beings like uh, creatures at that time. And something happened, and only eight of them were saved. And we'll talk about these eight that were saved. Uh, and survive the flood. And then we'll talk about the tree that got out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And last but not least, we'll talk about the bad influences that might uh, influence your choice and how you have to make a decision because your attitude will always determine your altitude. First, let's look at this passage of Scripture about the eight people that survived the flood. What happened? What actually happened? Genesis chapter 6 from verse 1 to 8, it gives the context of what was going on. Genesis 6, 1 to 8. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them. Now, again, remember, this is the fallen uh, mankind. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful. This term here, the sons of God, uh, refers to what we call uh, angelic beings who had, were assigned to just watch over human beings. These were not uh, uh, humans, but these were angelic beings with an assignment, the sons of God. They saw uh, the daughters of humans, they were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. And that wasn't God's plan, this intermingling of uh, species. That wasn't part of God's plan. But they broke the plan of God and they did what they're not supposed to do. And then you can see what God says. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of all, men of renown. This verse just goes very quickly, and some of us miss it. What, what is this Nephilim? 
These Nephilim were high-breed uh, creatures. They were not fully humans. They were not fully angels because of the mixing of uh, these two species, which is the angelic, uh, fallen be angelic beings with the human uh, women. They produced creatures that were not in God's plan. And they were Nephilim. And they were giants. They were huge. And they were able to do great exploits but they were not part of God's creation. And they were there even after the floods. Now, because God saw this, look at what happens in verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's quite um, scary, isn't it? Just think about it. God. When this mixture took place, there was a restraining factor. There was conscience. But when these creatures uh, started to increase in the, in the world and, and destroy the DNA of what God had originally prepared, things were getting bad to worse. And God says, this is not what I had intended. There's some people who have some beliefs, you know, I wouldn't say they're scholars necessarily, but their thoughts are that there was a redemption provided in the Garden of Eden. It was going to be the seat of mankind that through which the Messiah was going to come. And there were already fallen angels at that time because the very fact that the devil was present in the garden showed him that he was condemned and there was no, no redemption for him. So somehow maybe these fallen angels had the idea that if we can infiltrate into this redemptive blood, perhaps we too can be redeemed, which is never God's plan. Are you following me? There's some... Uh, Apocrypha, we call it, additional writings of the scriptures that shows that these fallen angels later on had not only uh, in, inhabited uh, women and produced giants, but they polluted creatures and reptiles and created all kinds of creatures which was never God's plan. And they had this ferocious appetite of consuming things that God had provided to the point of even consuming one another. That's just, you know, the, the, the script, writings outside of the scripture. But albeit the world was a violent place and humans' heart had become wicked. And the Lord, in verse 6 it says, regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. It was so bad. It was so, so bad. The entire world was corrupted to the point where God says, it's time to wipe out. Can you imagine? Just think about it. Add something else. And so, thank God there was one man who found favor in the eyes of God. We're talking about the wide and narrow, the choices that are being made. And we read the account of Noah and thank God for who he was. Very quickly, again back in the book of Genesis chapter 6, let's look at verses 9 to 21. This is the account of Noah and his family. Not our Noah that's in church. We know his family, but this Noah is the Bible Noah. Okay. <laughs> So Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. So in other words, you, now that doesn't mean that Noah was perfect. But when you take Noah and compare him to the generation of his time, he looked like an angel in the sense that he was righteous. Does it make any sense now? Because that whole generation, that whole race was corrupted. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So, make yourself an ark 
of cypress wood. Make rooms in it, coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I, I don't have time to go into so many details about this, but this ark is also an image of Jesus. And the sight speaks about the part of his body that was actually pierced where water and blood came out. I just wish I had time to go into all the significance of it, but we'll just go through. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. This is a very important word, covenant. Can everybody say covenant? Covenant. Remember what Jesus said when he, did, when he served the bread as well as the cup on the Passover meal? He said, this is the new covenant. The word covenant, covenant, covenant is so vital. So God says, I'm making covenant with you. You'll enter the ark, you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creatures that moves along the ground, listen to this, will Come to you to be kept alive. God had preserved, even among the, the creatures, that which wasn't corrupted. God had preserved among humanity that which is not corrupted, a line that can start all over again without the corruption of these uh, fallen angels uh, and also without the influence of these other creatures. So God said, they will come. The Spirit of God will draw, and they will come. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, it's amazing because it's in line with God's Word, also in terms of human. But Jesus once said that nobody can actually come to Him unless the Father draws them. Nobody can actually go unless the Father. So sometimes we think that, oh, I found God, I found Jesus. Honestly, you didn't find nothing. It was God who found you. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, it was God who found you. <laughs> Anyways, they'll come to you, he says, to be kept alive. There's only life in Christ. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and them. Noah did everything just as God commanded them because they were in the ark for many, many days. And therefore, God said, they will come to you, take some food, store it up, it's going to be good. So, this is what we call the narrow escape. You know, there, there was the broad, the whole world was like, nah, we're gonna, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be fine. And then we see how narrowly Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their wives. In total, you have eight people out of a population of only God knows. There's been debates among uh, the, the scholars that it could have been in the thousands, some says in the millions, some even says in the billions. We have no clue. There was one very interesting scientific, um, uh, what we would say, research which was once made, and somebody who is a population expert was able to calculate that according to so many years, if the population was so much, what it could be by this period of time. And some, some of them have very interesting uh, results according to those studies. But again, whatever it was, the entire human race was wiped out. And just again, it is not about just, you know, 20 people here or 40 people there. We're talking about the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Genesis 8, 15 to 22. Again, let Scripture speak for itself. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so that it can multiply on earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife, his sons' wives, all the animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds and everything that moves on, on the land came out of the ark one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and, 
and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed bird offerings to them on it. Um, some people said, hey, hang on a minute, I thought there were only two, two each, and then you, you take them out and then you kill them, you, you're going to lose them. Uh, according to the scriptures, they were in the ark for quite a while. And we have no clue how the animals had survived. Maybe they were hibern in hibernation. Maybe they were, you know, increasing in population. So when they came out naturally, there was a little bit more than what it was because the ark was built with enough room for expansion as well. So that's just for your understanding. Where did it come from? The Lord smelt the pleasing aroma and he said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the heart of heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, how you wish it only was said, heat and hotter, as though for those of us who live in <laughs> summer and winter, day and night will never cease. This is God's command. He says, by water, I'm not going to destroy this. That's why the Bible says that the, the next upcoming destruction is going to be fire. So, God had stopped at number eight because it was less than ten. Just keep this number at the back of your mind, ten, and we'll come to it later for you to see what is really going on. Then there is this Sodom and Gomorrah. There was eight people and the whole world was destroyed. And we have Abraham now interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah after having rescued uh, Lot during his captivity. Abraham left the heir of the Chaldeans. He went into the promised land. And while he was there, Lot had uh, um, been uh, with Abraham, got blessed. He hung around with the right guy and so got rich. And the you know, herdsmen started to fight and quarrel. And finally, Abraham said, Lot, please, please, no, no fight. Which way do you want to go? He said, oh, wow, Sodom and Gomorrah. That looks pretty cool. And I'm rich after all. I'm going to go there and have a good time. Went with all of his families and flocks. Abraham went into the desert, the opposite direction. And at one point, Sodom and Gomorrah got into trouble. They, there were political unrest, geopolitical issues. And the kings were, some of the kings came together. They collaborated. They went in and they took out the whole na the land. And Lord was gone. And Abraham actually was involved in rescuing Lord. And also, you know, sort of giving the territory back to them. It was such a scenario. And finally, one day, the Bible tells us that God speaks to Abraham over the fact that, you know what, Sodom and Gomorrah, I have to destroy it. Remember, the flood was at that time by water. And this time it's not water anymore. God is doing a destruction again, albeit a smaller scale. Probably there were thousands of people living in these two villages, a smaller scale, but albeit it had to be destroyed. And you're like, why? Because of this number. If there was 10 people, in the earth of Noah, they would have still been saved. They would still not been destroyed, but there was only eight. Now there were still less than 10 people, as you'll see the story. Genesis chapter 18, 16 to 33. Follow me as you read this story. It's kind of amazing. When the men got up to leave, they looked down. This man, by the way, were the uh, Theophany, we believe, uh, the, the G Jesus himself with with the two angels and these two angels, some scholars believe, could have been Michael and, and Gabriel. In any case, when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom and, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all the nations on the earth will be blessed through him. For I've chosen him and so, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about Abraham for Abraham what he had promised him. So God is now saying, oh, I'm walking down with Abraham on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, but um, can I hide it? He's my friend. Isn't it amazing if God calls you his friend? How many of you would be like to be called by God? His friend. You would like that? Can you remember what Jesus said to his disciples at one point? He said, hey, I no longer call you servants, but I called you friend. That's invitation from Jesus. 
So you, you, those of you who feel from that, oh, I feel lonely, I don't have a friend. You actually have an opportunity. Jesus said, would you be my friend? Can I, can I be your friend? And here God is sharing something very, very uh, intimate with him. And he says, can I be your friend? And so it goes on. Uh, then uh, in verse 20, then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I'll go down and see if, that, if they had done, what they have done rather is bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. The angels left. Now the theophany of the Lord was there, and Abraham is now bargaining. Look at the way Abraham's reasoning with God. Because he's God's friend, they have similar values. He understands a little bit about God's operations. Then Abraham approached him and said, in verse 23, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and, and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. And Abraham knows, look at what Abraham says, will not the judge of all the earth do right. Amen. The confidence that Abraham had on this God. He says, you are the judge of the earth. Of course you will do right. I know you're going to do right. Then, Abraham spoke up again. And of course, um, the Lord says in verse 26, the Lord said, if I find, if, 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 I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. What a, oh God have mercy. God have mercy. Then Abraham spoke up again. And now that I have been so bold to speak to the Lord, do I am nothing but dust and ashes? What if the number of the righteous is less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? And if I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, Abraham, you see, Abraham, you know, he's really a Jew. He's able to bargain. He's pushing it further and further, little by little. He says, let's see how far we can go. <laughs> he's trying to get the best price. <laughs> Once again, he spoke. What if only 40 are found there, he said. For the sake of the 40, I'll not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. Let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I'll not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I've been so bold uh, as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of the 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. I mean, this guy is really pushing it, right? <laughs> but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found? That's the secret number. He knew it, and he knows God. 10 that's about it. Ten. Look at what God says. Let me speak just once more. Um, what if only ten can be found? He answered, for the sake of ten, I'm not destroyed. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham. He left and Abraham returned home. Remember in Noah's time, there was not even ten. There's only eight left. There was less than ten. Righteous. And God said, no way. This, this, my, my grace, my mercy is forever, but there's a limit. And that's why God said that the cry against Sodom and Gomorrah has reached me and I've got to go and see myself. Is it really, really that bad? Is it true that there's not 10 people? 10 people? That was the level. That was God's mercy. And therefore, uh, we need to understand that... Um, in all of this, because there was less than 10, they, were, they had to escape. In fact, not only were there less than 10, there were not even eight. 
In fact, there was four that managed to get out of, so- of Sodom and Gomorrah. Out of the four, only three made it. One became a little bit too salty. <laughs> Genesis, no, one, one guy got it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 29. Here's the story. I'm just going to read it and you know, let the Lord's word uh, speak to you by itself. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and the Lord was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside. Um, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet, spend the night, and then go on your way. And in the morning, no, they answered, we will only, we will spend the night in the square. So a lot, you know, seems to realize that something beautiful is here. Uh, this doesn't look like normal uh, Sodom and Gomorrah inhabitants. These are tour, uh, maybe tourists, but they're travelers. But somehow he, he refers to them as my lords. But he insisted so strongly that he did go with him and entered the house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate before they had to go to bed. All the men every, from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lord, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so, we, so that we can have sex with them. Lord went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under my protection, the protection of my roof. Can you imagine a father doing that? Huh? I mean, those of you who have daughters... I don't have daughters, I have sons, but I still protect them with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. <laughs> just, just think about it. He, he's here. These guys came into my protection. I cannot. Uh, Lord God, have mercy. And look at what the, 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 the guys, because, you know, Lord is a foreigner, he's a stranger. In verse 9, get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge? We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lord and moved forward to break down the door, but the man inside reached out and pulled Lord back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so they could not find the door. God have mercy. Talk about the judgments of God. The two men said to the Lord, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, daughters, or sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So the Lord went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Sometimes you speak the truth to people, they think it's a joke. You tell them that, hey, there is going to be judgment. That there is going to be a day we're going to see the Lord. Don't mess around with God. Don't play around. Ah, you're joking. Those people existed even then. These fellas, they didn't know that because they thought he was joking, very soon they're going to be cooking. But anyways... With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Imagine, Lot is still lingering, you know. Let me try and get some people. They're not. The sun's about to set. He's like, nah. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. The Lord said, No, my lords, your servant has found, if your fa- servant has found favor in your eyes and if you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. 
He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. That town was also supposed to be doomed. But flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. In other words, God has made a covenant. God has made a promise he, to, to know I'm trying to save you. I got to get you out. You're less than 10. This place has to be destroyed because that's God's image, uh, uh, practice. You know, it's kind of interesting because one day will come when God will actually snatch some people away from this planet before it's going to be destroyed. Uh, it's a mystery. The Bible talks about God, some of us being caught up with him. It'll happen so quickly. But before destruction, God does this saving. Can you see the, the similar print, you know, patterns here? It's interesting, isn't it? And then we go on. <clears throat> that, uh, uh, that is why the town was called Zoah. By the time the Lord reached Zoah, the sun had risen over the, the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. In fact, some scientists have found the, the remains of it today, and, and they can attest that there's, this, there's a place uh, that they believe is Sodom and Gomorrah. It's full of ashes and, and sulfur. They believe this came supernaturally. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the veg vegetation of the land. But Lord's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Like That's why I said she was quite salty. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the, to the land and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities to the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. So, narrow, broad. The, the vast majority, they were like, we want homosexuality, we want sex, young, old, we want, you know, adult, we want anything that's unrighteous. And God said, Ten. Probably there was ten, but until it became less than ten, it was over. Until it became less than ten. Now, last uh, thought I want to leave behind you before we close in prayer is about the fact that bad influences over your choices, they can destroy you. Peter extensively wrote about what we call suffering as a Christian because it's a struggle. He talked about family life. He talked about submitting to authorities. He talked about deception of false prophets and false teaching. So first, first Peter, second Peter, if you read them as, 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 a, as a pistol, it'll help you a lot because this is Peter, the, the close, one of the closest ones uh, to Jesus, and he could understand the heart of Jesus. And Peter begins to explain to us in his teachings about all these things, and towards the end he said, watch out, guys, just watch out. All right, I know that you're going to be suffering as a Christian, but watch out to know that there is a broad part and a narrow part. And Peter summarizes all that I've said to you. Again, scriptures. Let the scripture interpret the scripture. And we end with these last few passages of scripture. Ten verses from Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Now listen to Peter. Peter, the apostle that was close to Jesus, as was James and John. He said, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. We already spoke about two destructive scenarios, Noah's time, Sodom and Gomorrah. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Many will follow. The way of truth is the gospel. So in our times, you've got to be watching out because there will be a lot of people, many, majority, vast. And it says here in verse 3, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Normally going into a lot of details of what they've heard and seen. And their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned and send them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held in judgment, these were some of those fallen angels. 
I spoke about earlier on. They stepped out of their place. And they got into a situation where they were not supposed to do what they did. And God put some of them in change. That, that place, actually, the scripture refers to as not just Hades, but it refers to it as uh, Seol, a place, uh, Tartarus, a place where demons, fallen angels are kept in, uh, in chains. This is what Peter is referring to. He said, look, guys, listen. If angels fall, there's punishment, right? And then he goes on and he says, and if God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on his ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. So now Peter is saying, angels fall, punishment. Noah's time, he was saved. Noah was actually called a preacher of righteousness. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to ungodly people. We just spoke of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you see the links? How Peter is trying to build his case? It's interesting, isn't it? And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct and law of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Sometimes you might be living in a land where things go wrong and you are a righteous person. Your conscience bugs you. Day and night you're seeing it. The vast majority of people are doing it. And it bothers you, it affects you. Your, your soul is vexed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? In the midst of unrighteousness, unholiness, sometimes in the name of God, and you, you're vexed in your spirit. That was the condition of Lord at the time. This is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is the real gospel. God saves and God punishes. But sometimes some popular teaching we have is that God only saves everybody, the righteous and the unrighteous. Everybody, don't worry how you live. It's okay. But that's not the gospel. That's a popular teaching that you've got to be watch out, watchful for because there is grace, but there's also judgment. That's the true gospel. That's the true gospel. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh, and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. So therefore, it's very, very important to stay on the narrow path and avoid uh, popular opinions. This uh, uh, passage of, of, of the book of Peter goes on in Second Peter, and, and I think probably we should sort of end there. It says here, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 11, Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. Like They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. The, their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. Their blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable, the experts in greed, and a cursed brood. Man, Peter is pretty strong here, isn't he? Uh, God, have mercy. he's not mincing his words here. Do you think Peter is saying all of this to make you upset? Do you think Peter is saying this out of a heart of love? Remember, he was crucified upside down with this belief. So when I read some of the things this apostle is saying, and I'm like, whoa, God have mercy. And then he goes on and he says in verse 15, they have left the straight way and wandered off and followed the way of Balaam, son of Bazaar, who, son, son of the Bazaar actually, who loved the wages of wickedness. 
But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Some of these guys are prophets, you know, it's amazing. But people, these people are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. God have mercy. You know, Jesus was so upset with a bunch of people like this because there were these Pharisees and Sadducees. They literally traveled overseas to try and, and make converts. You, you hear very little about this in Judaism, especially uh, the Judaism of the times of Christ. They went overseas, and Jesus was very upset with them because these Pharisees and Sadducees, they, were self, they themselves were not listening to the Scriptures or following the Scriptures. And he said, woe unto you, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you teachers of the law. He said, you travel land and sea to make a convert. And then when you finally make this convert, you, 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 you turn him twice the devil as you are. And you're like, whoa. What a, what a task. And this is some, some, something what these false prophets were doing in teaching and letting people astray from, instead of going to the narrow path, just going to this broad. And here we read again, and it says in verse 19, they promised them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for peoples are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them, for, for, for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, Proverbs are written, a dog returns to its vomit. And a soul that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. So you can see very clearly here that the choices we make makes us. Amen? So therefore, it's very, very important to understand that uh, there are popular choices that anybody can make. Ask yourself, what is biblical? What is biblical? What does what, what the Lord wants us? And um, don't just go by, but you know, everybody's doing this. It feels good. It feels nice. Yeah, if everybody's doing it just because everybody's jumping into the lake of fire, doesn't mean you have to as well. Amen? Be the Noah. Be the Lord. Be the people who would stand up and say, no, I'm not going to. So I'm going to conclude now because God wants all of us to be saved. In fact, He wants us all to go through the narrow path and it's not popular. Narrow path is not popular. We'll end with these few scriptures and then we end. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 above 3 to 10. Scripture's, scriptural warning is this. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming is promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on. As it is since the beginning of the creation. But, they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. Can you see the scriptures, like in Peter's epistles in particular, constantly keep going back to Noah's time, keep going back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you remember what Jesus said? He said that as it was in the days of Noah, so will the Son of Man come. Can you remember that? When Jesus was in Capernaum, he said that, woe unto you, Capernaum, it will be easier for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than it was for you. Can you remember that? The God himself refers to these narrow, broad paths as, as kind of a, there's something here that we have to look, understand and, and realize. It's not just, nah, there was just a nice story. Ooh, Noah's Ark, all the animals inside and the rainbow behind. It's not about that. It's a, it's a, it's a warning for us, about narrow and, 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 and broad. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. But the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, 
A thousand days is like a year. Yes, the Lord is slow in keeping His promise. As some understand, uh, it's not slow rather in keeping His promise. Not as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to, but everyone to come to repentance. Repentance. And repentance is something you do, you know, it's a proactive thing. It's not a passive thing. Repentance is not when, when I just wave my hands over you like this and then you're all repented. You're, you can get baptized a thousand times over, even in the Jordan River. That doesn't make you repent. <laughs> repentance is an active, proactive uh, attitude that comes from your heart as the Holy Spirit convicts you. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done will be laid bare. Amen? So therefore, God wants us to be saved. But he's not forced. However, will we be saved? Will we bear the consequences of our own decisions? That is something that we'll have to uh, decide by ourselves. And I told you that there were eight people. And then there were down to three, and God was asking, is there, is there ten, is there ten? And at some point, some scholars believe that there will be a rapture where the church will be taken away before the final judgment of God and the destruction. But at this point, we see two people in the Scriptures, two. So we're from eight, we're down to three, and now we're down to two, the last two. At the end of the day, when the rapture takes place, when the church is no longer in this earth, everything is gone. God is just about to finish this world once and for all before it's all laid bad. He gives again an opportunity. Two witnesses come down from heaven. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows. Some believe that it could be Elijah because he was taken away, and it could be uh, Enoch because Enoch walked with God and he was no, no more. Some believe that. I don't know if it's them because they said, okay, they, they didn't face that, so they have to. Anyway, these two witnesses come down, giving a chance to preach. Even though there's no church, there's no Holy Spirit, the, 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 the judgment of God, this is what happens. And we're close with this. We try and see whether the people will repent and say, hallelujah, this is a sign of. In fact, the Bible actually says that there will be angels even flying around with the eternal gospel on the <laughs> Lord have mercy. Talk about the mercies of God. Let's just read this before we end. Narrow path and the broad path, your choices makes you. We're still in the same thing before we close. Uh, Revelations 11, 1 to 14. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God, an altar with its worshippers. But exclude the outer court and do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tremble on the holy city for 42 months. And I'll appoint my two witnesses. See, now we're down to two. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive leaves, trees rather, and the two lampstands. And they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Man, I'm telling you about it. Uh, it's going to be quite a scary scene. <laughs> Imagine you try to harm these guys. Fire comes out of their mouth. Anyways, they have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. They have power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plagues as often as they want. Talk about the plagues that took place in Egypt. Something similar. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss will attack them and overpower the city. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and kill them. Their bodies will lie down in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Can you see the, 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 the pattern again there? So we saw judgment, Sodom, now Egypt, the ten plagues, where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some, uh, some from every tribe People, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse to bury them. Three and a half days. I don't know whether they're going to do, see it through satellite or whatever, 
but still the whole world is able to see these two witnesses die. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, like Christmas, because these two prophets had tormented those who live on earth. I don't understand why people want to kill the, the good guys. Anyways, let's see what happens here in verse 11. But after the three and a half days, the breath from life, of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. That was like what we see in Je- Re- Re- Revelation chapter 3 where the Lord says, come, come here, I'm going to show you something to John. And then we don't read about the church anymore. Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while the enemies looked on. At that very hour where there was a severe earthquake, a tent of the city collapsed, 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and, uh, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven finally. The second woe has passed and the third woe is to come and there it goes on. So anyway, the, the thing I want to draw your attention to is that there were eight, there were three, there were two. It looks like the path is kind of getting narrower and narrower, the number of believers. It's kind of interesting. So as we proceed you know, in, the, uh, in the next couple of weeks in the book of Matthew chapter 7 towards uh, the conclusion of the, the Sermon on the Mount, we are taught of some very interesting things. Right after this teaching, Jesus talks about true and false disciples. Then he talks about true and false prophets. Then he talks about foundation. What are you built on? It's amazing. This is thousands of years before, and we're having it today, at least 2,000. And Jesus is saying, guys, watch out, watch out. I want you to go to the narrow path. And in all these teachings, there's going to be this, there's going to be this, there's going to be this. And, and he ends by saying, disciples, are you the true one or are you the false one? Prophets, who is the true one, who's the false one? And in, in order by you, by determining this now built on the foundations, all goes down to the foundation, what is your foundation? Amen rather than what is popular. Again, the hope of our salvation is the atoning redemption work of Jesus on the cross, which is an invitation to everyone, because God doesn't want anyone to perish. But in order to do that, we'll have to choose the narrow path, which is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's Jesus Christ. There's no other name that's been given under heaven through which we can be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us, please, in the name of Jesus, to understand that Christianity is not sensationalism. It's not about popularity contest. It's not about just what the vast majority are doing. It's about a personal relationship with you based on your word. So help us, God. Help us, help us, help us to walk the narrow path and help us to judge ourselves with the word and measure ourselves with the word and spread the message to the word. Help us, Lord, to follow you with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.